in the few previous lectures, we had worked out the details of the control unit of a computer. <coughs> now, before we proceed further, let us quickly review what we have done so far. We started with saying that a computer system essentially consists of processor or central processing unit and memory. And quite at length, we had also discussed I.O. as an extended memory. And so whatever we may discuss about CPU memory interaction, roughly it will, all, it will also hold good for CPU I.O. Okay, we will talk in more detail about it later. Then we took up the study of the processor. Now CPU essentially consists of, uh, in general I would say processor or we may say the arithmetic logic processor or arithmetic logic unit plus a few registers. Okay? Together this consists of what we may call as data path architecture. Okay, data path architecture. <coughs> now, the processing is either arithmetic or logic, as it says. And registers are part of CPU holding information much as memory will hold information. Okay, fine. Then, we worked out the data path in fact, we just uh, considered a typical data path architecture, nothing specific okay, about it, a very generalized structure, and worked out the sequence of actions, right? And the sequence in which the data should move, for which the path must be set up with the aid of the appropriate control signals. So we said CPU essentially consists of the processing unit, which is either I mean, generally arithmetic logic, and the other part as the control. In fact, regarding this control, we went into much discussion. <coughs> uh, we worked out that's what we were doing in the last few lectures. Now, the control will essentially set up the signals. So that we'll call this data path control signals. Okay. The controller, the control unit or the control will generate the necessary control signals so that whatever that is necessary uh, in the processor, that is in setting up the path for the data, will be achieved by these control signals. And uh, we worked out specifically, uh, yes, for what instruction fetch for just fetching one instruction or part of an instruction, whatever you may call, okay, for that particular instruction fetch, we worked out the details, right? From which we arrived at the concept of a micro word, because essentially the instruction fetch, as we saw, consisted of four states information, that is information related to only four states, and for each state, the signals that are necessary to set up the data path, that information is available from the micro world. So directly we went into one specific implementation of the controller, which we may call as a micro programmed controller, okay, micro programmed controller. And, uh, Basically, to get an idea of other types of implementation, that is implementation other than the microprogrammed type of controller, we also went and studied the details of a hardware controller. Okay, hard. Uh, we may call it as a hardwired logic controller, if you want. Okay, hardwired logic controller. That is, it is. Uh, in contrast with microprogrammed controller, you have a hardwired logic controller. Both will achieve the same, but then the implementations are different. Now, we saw that a processor is essentially a state machine. Okay, 
as a state machine and the particular uh, thing is derived because state by state the machine goes through and corresponding to each uh, state a set of signals that are required essentially control signals that are required will be available in the micro board in the specific implementation of micro programmed controller okay now the processor is a very complicated state machine we cannot really work out the full details of what will happen in each state for the entire processor so what we did was to consider a simple example that is we took uh, as an aside actually a master slave flip flop okay master slave specifically jk flip flop as one example of the state machine master slave jk flip flop as one example of a state machine because in this in this particular case there are only three inputs yj yk and yc to be considered that is j and k being the two inputs and c is the clock input which essentially defines the state duration okay and we said just it will generate two outputs one for zero state and one for one state so essentially we call them as h1 and h0 in trying to work out the details of the relations between the outputs and the inputs we saw that this particular, call it as a system or a machine or a component, it hardly matters. Okay, so anyway, it's an example. This particular machine was going through four states, just four states. Okay, so with four states, we are able to describe the behavior of this entire flip flop. And with three inputs, two outputs, and four states, we are able to completely work out the details of first the microprogrammed controller and then also go into the details of the hardwired logic. So this is what we were doing in the previous class. Now state by state any systems behavior can be expressed for which we were using the algorithmic state machine or what you may call as an ASM chart and we saw how this ASM chart gives you the information about state by state behavior. And state by state, we consider what is going on. And then I asked you to e extend that concept in the case of microprogrammed controller or a hardware logic controller of a processor also. The same way, whatever we did for four states. In the case of processor, we'll have to do for 40 states, maybe 400 states, or whatever it is. Fine, that's what we were going through the, uh, in the previous lectures. Good. Now, <coughs> we will, uh, uh, actually, I, I, sh I have to tell you that the detailed study which we were carrying out in the previous lectures essentially is part of architecture. It's not really part of organization. But an understanding of what is going on there is essential to appreciate what is going on at a higher level. Okay, That is the thing. Fine? So because you can see that all these things are from the designer point of view, whether it's a microprogram control or whether it's a hardware logic control, hardware control, the user is not really concerned with it. It is only the designer part. So actually, essentially, it is the architecture. That's why we are also talking about the data path architecture. Okay, good. Now, let us go to the user point of view. What are the things he will be essentially concerned with? First, what are the various instructions that the processor supports? At this point, let me recall what I was telling you a little earlier also. For each instruction, that is, we are talking about a set of instructions or instruction repertoire, okay? I'll just use the word instruction set. Set of instructions that a processor is capable of executing, okay? Any processor <coughs> capable of executing. 
for which it will have some controller. Okay? For each instruction, details will have to be worked out about all the states through which the processor goes. And then finally, the controller for the processor must be designed. Fine? Now, talking about instruction set, that is the different types of instructions which a processor can execute. We have to know two things. One is, what is the format of the instruction? Okay. Now, this would also, to a large extent, decide the internal architecture also. Fine. Instruction format and associated with that, we also have to be concerned with the data format. What is it we are talking about here? At first take, basically it is the, the format or the form in which the data is available or the form in which the instruction is available. Okay, that's what we are talking about here. So we'll just take uh, instruction format. Now, an instruction essentially would consist of uh, indicating what the operation is. Okay, and so there is a code which indicates that is the op code, which says what actually is the type of instruction. For instance. You can have a simple move instruction that is moving from, say, one register to another register. And there may be another instruction, say, for add, which will tell ALU that it has to carry out addition, like this. Okay? So the code will uniquely identify what that instruction is. And the second part of the instruction is the operand. That is, our operands. It all depends on how many operands. So that's what it is. That is, there must be one field which indicates the opcode and another field which indicates what are the operands in which the operation will have to be carried out. That is, that the instruction format essentially will talk about that. Let's uh, assume that. Uh, we have three types of uh, uh, operands. Okay? For instance, it's easy. If you have, say, addition, then suddenly we would talk about add as the operation, and the operands will be at least two, right? Say A and B, or X and Y, whatever it is. So, now, if you have this kind of an instruction, this is an instruction, this is an add instruction. This instruction says add x and y. Okay, x and y is added, but then where the sum will be, you can also say, for instance, the sum may be in some place, or you can just assume that this particular one will carry out this addition of x and y, and the sum it will store. Let us assume it is in uh, uh, destination source. So there are different ways in which it is done. Generally, this will take it. Okay. It's we call one data as source, uh, say, <coughs> source data. That is the source operand. And the other one, we may call it as a destination operand. What do we call them so you will be able to see it right here? Because the sum finally goes into this. Okay? So we say the contents of let, let us assume X and Y as two registers. They can also they can also be memory locations, no problem. So so X is one data available in one location, and Y is another data available in another location. So from that location, we call that we can call that as a source location and destination location. From the source location, take the data, and from the destination location, take the data, add these, the sum send it to destination location. Because x happens to be the one, the, uh, rather, the location, this particular location happens to be the one which receives a sum, this is called destination. Okay? That's how the name comes. Now, 
The, you can have, uh, for instance, uh, instead of add x y, you can also have add x y and another thing s, and then s can be the third location, right? There are different forms, but here we'll just assume just this particular one is in fact an instruction or operation which refers to two operands. So this is in fact a specific case of a specific example of a double operand instruction. Okay, double operand instruction. Now, um, suppose there is uh, <coughs> another instruction which says uh, just increment the contents of a location or say a register. And for instance, INC may be the code for the increment, in which case you, you just need to specify only one data. Because basically, here actually it means there is a location x. From location x, take the contents and add one to it and put it back. In other words, what the, uh, the end effect of this will be to take x, the contents from the location, add, and then put it back in x. Now, the source and destination both happen to be the same thing. Fine? Good. <coughs> So this, in fact, is one example of a single operand instruction. Single operand instruction. Now, there can also be uh, the third type of categories in which no operand is specified at all. That is, no operand instruction. There is absolutely no operand referred to. What is this no operand? There's no operand, for instance, yeah, an instruction like just halt the computer. So no data need be specified in that case. Okay? Halt the computer. Good. So we have three types. A double operand instruction, okay? A double operand instruction. Then a single operand instruction. Then, yeah, no operand or zero operand instruction. Now, whatever may be the, uh, the class of instructions, the format must be in such a way that the processor will be able to identify which particular one is part, uh, any instruction is. So we will have a common instruction format, and some part of the instruction will indicate what type of instruction it is, whether it's single operand or double operand or no operand. Okay? And so you will find that the size of the instruction also keeps changing. Right? Now we'll talk more about that a little later. Now before we proceed to further discussion, let us also take a look at the data format. Now, the different types of data will have to be accommodated because it, the, what is data essentially numbers, and the numbers um, may be uh, specified using some number system. Okay, for instance, you may use binary numbers, you may use decimal numbers, right, and any other number system, and uh, uh, then another thing is. You may specify uh, a particular number with the decimal point in it, right? For instance, suppose you want to specify 24.58, right? Then if the point always comes in a specific position, the given length, then we talk about a fixed point, okay? Fixed point. Uh, arithmetic, that is arithmetic related to those type of numbers. Sometimes we will let the point float anywhere and then indicate by another uh, thing. For instance, 24.8 can also be specified as 2.458 into 10 to the power 1, right? You may also specify it as 0 0.2458 into 10 to the power 2. 
So, by having the appropriate varying index, in, indices, we can let this particular point float. Now, this we talk about as the decimal point. If it is a, a binary, then we will talk about a binary point appropriately. So, now instead of this fixed, here we see that in this representation, by changing the indices, what we are doing is we are letting the point float anywhere along. So, we talk about floating point, right? floating point. So, like this, the data format will have to give us idea about, we will have to accommodate different types of number system and different types of representation of numbers. Right? So, the data format will have to be worried about that, for that also. All right, as you can see that this particular one is more concerned with the processing part. How exactly this uh, thing is being done is again uh, designers. The user must know what are the types of uh, number systems the sy number system can be used to represent the data and what are the types of uh, the number representation here whether it is fixed or floating if so what is the range okay because there are uh, many things related to it. These are the things you must know. How exactly this is implemented is again the architecture, architectural designer point, point okay, not from the, really the user point. Now we will elaborate on the instruction format and then uh, discuss a few things. Maybe what we would do is we will check uh, in order to provide uh, some continuity with uh, what we have discussed earlier to bring you back okay, to the data path, data path control and so on. What I would do is I will just take one example of uh, double operating instruction. We will just take add itself and then work out the full details of the sequence of the data path control for that. For which we have to know what is the architecture. right? So, with reference to an architecture, we will work out the details. So, any instruction is first fetched and then it is interpreted or decoded okay and then it's executed in fact we had discussed this quite at length and uh, we also opt out full details about fetching of an instruction while discussing that i was mentioning we do not know much about the size of the instruction okay and then the size of the bus so, if for instance an instruction is a 2 byte instruction and if the bus can accommodate only an 1 byte data, then that instruction must be fetched in 2 steps, 1 byte at a time, which would mean 2 machine cycles, right? Because we discussed also instruction cycle consisting of machine cycles and in each machine cycle there will be 1 bus access. So, the bus access is actually to fetch an instruction, in this particular case part of the instruction. So, what it does is it fetches the instruction. Now, for instance, if we take add x y, if this happens to be a 2 byte instruction, then in 2 machine cycles the instructions will be fetched. If it were a 3 byte instruction and uh, that is assuming the bus can accommodate only one byte, then it will bring it in three machine cycles. So, this we had worked out earlier. Now, <coughs> let us go through this. First instruction fetch, now that is the major phase. Okay? So, for fetching this instruction, now we have to assume a few things. Uh, what shall we do? Uh, we will do one thing, this is the simplest thing to do. I okay? will uh, <coughs> assume here that there are two data x and y of which x is already available in a register. Okay? This, uh, the, the data x is available in a register that is uh, already with the CPU and y will have to be fetched from memory. Okay? So, 
Now you can see that for fetching the instruction, okay, for fetching the instruction, you have <coughs> you need uh, some machine cycle or machine cycles, and for fetching the data from the memory, the second one, you need some more. Uh, okay, one or two machine cycles. It all depends on the size of the data, right? So what I'm doing is I'm assuming x data x is available in register and data y is available from memory. So with this, let us proceed. All right. Now, what is the size of the instruction? I'll uh, just say it is a two-byte instruction. Okay. Just uh, we have to assume a few things. Then only we can proceed further. So a two-byte instruction, which means <coughs> In the memory, so we assume that all the instructions are in the memory, no? So in the memory, which I will assume as a byte organized memory, which means at any time <coughs> we can fetch one byte in the memory from the memory, okay? Now, two locations are needed for this particular add instruction. That is add xy is available in two bytes. And uh, I will also assume that this particular instruction is location 1000, memory location, memory address 1000 and 1001. Fine? Now, the how will this uh, instruction be fetched? Something in the CPU must indicate that this instruction is in location 1000 and 1001, right? We know that, right? Let's take a look at the architecture, and then uh, that will give us some idea. So here we have the program counter, two data registers, DR1 and DR2, and one instruction register and one address register. So from the address register, we find the outgoing 8-bit address lines, and uh, we have the data bus part of it, the data input part of it, and the data output part of it, okay, each 8-bit width. Since we are assumed uh, uh, byte size for the data path, uh, sorry, the data bus, okay, this is the data bus. Obviously, byte by byte, that is 8 bit at a time, the instructions will be fetched. Since we assumed two byte instruction, one byte will come, it will be routed to the instruction register, and then in the second step, another byte will come, that also will be routed to the instruction register. Now, since we assumed a two-byte instruction, obviously this instruction register will be off with two bytes. Agreed? Fine. Now, <coughs> well, there are a few assumptions that we are making. Okay, uh, it may not uh, really be so with reference to any specific processor. And another thing uh, I would like to bring your attention to: I assumed only two registers in the architecture. Okay. Just to make life simple, uh, there can be many registers there. If you have many registers, what is it? There must be a mechanism by which we can indicate which of the register, okay, those things we are avoiding. Now, uh, since we have taken an instruction which assumes one uh, data is already available, right, in the register, and another one is in the memory, right? So one of the data will have to be either in DR1 or DR2. Agreed? Fine. Then, take a look. This PC is a program counter. Now, what is the function of this? Essentially, the PC holds the address of the instruction always. Now, in our case, since we have assumed that the instruction is in location, memory location 1000 and 1001. It is implied that PC to start with, right, must hold the address 1000, 
Okay, that is the first point. That is, in the CPU, okay, there are many things. That is, the entire data path is there. And PC, to start with, must hold the address 1000. Why 1000? Because that is where the, the specific instruction starts. Now, the first step, what is it? We may not work out all the steps, a few things at least. Now let us see the chart again. So PC holds 1000. Now this 1000 must go to address register. And then the, on the address bus, the number 1000 must be placed. Right? Just the data path of it. And then uh, let us recall how this instruction is fetched. The control signal must be generated. Here we are fetching the instruction, which means read control signal must be generated next. Okay? And the processor will be reading it in. Then let us see how this sequence proceeds. <coughs> um, <coughs> PC content that is 1000 must go to the uh, instruction, sorry, address register. Fine? Now that is the first thing to do. Yes, the CPU, uh, let us go through the cycle. The CPU places the address, indicates whether it is going to read or write. Now fetching means it is going to read in. Now since you have assumed a two byte instruction, it is going to read in one byte. And one byte comes over the data uh, bus. Then it cannot immediately go to decode decoding of instruction because the entire instruction is not available okay so what it will uh, what it will do is to place the next address again and bring the next byte now how will the processor know that it's a 2 byte instruction or a 3 byte instruction or a 1 byte instruction right so obviously Whatever may be the size of the instruction, the very first byte of the instruction must indicate to the processor that another byte is there for that instruction, or two more bytes are there in the instruction. This is important. Actually, you remember I was talking about the instruction format and then two fields, opcode and what was it? Opcode and op operand. I said, right? We did not really. Uh, operands in general and in our case it is so we did not really discuss what is the size of the opcode and uh, also the other fields in this operand we have not discussed that yet so the very first byte of the instruction must include the opcode and that will indicate what is the size of the instruction also otherwise the processor will not know what to do okay so the very first part of the instruction, that is very first byte of the instruction which comes in, will indicate what is the size of the instruction. So the processor knows that it cannot immediately proceed to decode, that is proceed with what exactly is the operation to be executed and so on. It will continue and fetch the second byte of the instruction also. Okay? Good. I hope without loss of generality we have made certain assumptions. Fine? Good. So the first the CPU places the address. Then it indicates that it wants to read. And then the memory responds and CPU reads. Remember the four states we were talking about T1, T2, T3, T4? Right. Now fetch the first thing. Now fetch we know must consist of two things. What is that? First is <coughs> you can refer to the chart again. Okay. The PC contents, which is uh, 1000. Okay, PC contents must be placed on the address bus. This is the first thing. PC contents must go to the address bus. In fact, we had worked out the details of this. Let's see the chart. The PC contents go to the address bus. How? The control signals must be such that the whatever is placed on this leg of the multiplexer will be passed on to the output and the ALU must be set up, okay, the control for ALU must be set up in such a way that this input will be passed on as the output of ALU 
and the multiplexer must be enabled such that whatever is passed on this leg goes here and then this address register must be enabled so that it will accept what comes okay from here and that will place ad again address register output must be enabled so that that whatever comes must be placed on the address bus we have worked out the details earlier okay so when we say pc goes to address bus what it means is the data path for this content must be like this through max alu another max and so on and then to the ar and then to the output or to the address bus right we have worked out so all these things are there now the entire thing can take place in one state. So we have this in general at the, uh, at the register transfer level we are writing this as PC contents go to the address bus. Good. Now other things you know. Now once it is on the address bus then the memory will have to get the appropriate control signal. So that is the next one. So the next uh, uh, micro instruction will be uh, which of course we have not indicated in the data path uh, because we have not worked out the details of the control. We just write that the read signal must be placed on the control part of the bus. So I just put it as control part of the bus or C bus, right? Now when the read control, the controller generates the read signal and places it on the control part of the bus. Simultaneously, we can see that the program counter contents can always be incremented because there is no harm in incrementing because this will be done in parallel. Okay, so in another state, okay, uh, <coughs> both these uh, signals can be generated so that with the same control signal, we'll call this as T2. The read control signal can be placed on the bus and the same control signal can also be used to increment the contents of the program counter. Now, mainly, uh, I think we have discussed this earlier. We normally increment the program counter. In fact, that's why it's called a counter, not just a register, okay? It's called a counter because normally the subsequent instruction or subsequent bytes of the instructions will be in successive locations. So you use a counter and keep uh, telling the CPU, okay, fetch from the next location, next location, and so on. And then at some point there may be a change. If there is a change, the PC can a new data can a new address can be loaded into the PC. Okay. Or, or certainly uh, you must have heard about branch and jump instructions. In those instructions, for instance, when those instructions come, some new address will be overwritten into PC. PC and then normally will be incremented. Okay. Right. So, uh, in one state, the PC contents goes to the address bus. In the next state, read control is generated and simultaneously PC contents are incremented. And then we are just uh, allowing one state for memory. Okay. That is from the memory point of view. Let us work out only from CPU point of view. Assuming that the memory is responding because memory wanted, wants two things. Memory wants to know from which address, okay, it has to generate data and what it should do with the data. Whether it should put it out onto the bus or whether it should accept the data from the bus. Now, in this case, read. If it has to accept, then it will be right, okay. We will uh, come to that later. Maybe it will be part of this. Uh, even this instruction itself, maybe in the later half. The next is the CPU assuming, okay, this at this point it's assumed. Assuming that the memory is ready with the data, then whatever is available on the data bus, which uh, now since uh, we are in the chart, just uh, see the chart, you can see that data dot in, <coughs> data dot in, over data dot in the the data that the memory has placed will will be coming in okay now that must be rooted where because this is an instruction it must be rooted to the instruction register now 
what did we assume? We assumed a two byte instruction. So obviously, there must be two parts of the instruction. So I will just put it as IR okay, 1. There must be two parts of the instruction. No? So one part it will go to. Now, at the end of this one, two, three steps, the CPU has got one part of the instruction. It is just the instruction. Okay? Now, <coughs> actually, some decoding of this particular byte, instruction byte itself, that is the first byte of the instruction itself, will be done, which will indicate to the CPU one more part must come in. So, really, the fetch phase is not yet over, it continues. Okay? And again, the same thing. What is it? PC contents will be placed. Fine. Why PC contents are placed on the address bus or address part of the bus? Because already PC is pointing to the next one. We already incremented it. Right? After fetching one byte, PC content had been incremented. And so now PC contents when placed on the bus, actually it means 1001 is placed on the address bus. And the same thing as before. So just repeat, read control will be generated. It will be put on the control part of the bus. And in parallel, PC contents will be incremented. OK? There's nothing new about it. And the same thing again. Now, whatever comes over the data bus, OK? Remember, we are assuming that memory is ready. The memory is not ready, but something more must be done here. So whatever is coming over the data part of the bus will now be routed to the second part of the instruction register. Okay? So <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, let's see the chart. What we are assuming is instruction register is a Two byte is of two byte width. Okay? Fine? All right. Good. So the two bytes of the instruction have come into the processor. Okay. Now what is the next? The entire instruction is now available with the processor. So the instruction fetch part of it is over. That's what it is. Now our <coughs> full decoding of the instruction is possible, from which it will know uh, whatever we assumed earlier. That is, we assumed that one data is available in the register CPU itself, and another data is available in the memory, which means some part of this instruction will have to carry the memory address. Memory address that is the address which stores y. Some part of this instruction will also indicate that the second data, which is the x, is already available in register. Now, see the chart. We have assumed only two registers. So what shall we assume? Let us assume that this particular uh, uh, register is uh, that is, x is available, okay? x is available in register dr1, all right? Assuming, I'm just assuming it. That means now this <coughs> CPU has the whole instruction and it also has, uh, okay. D or 1, we are assuming, right? It's all right. There is no harm. Uh, <coughs> whole instruction, and it also has the data x, because D or 1 is there as part of the CPU. So the data is already available. So from the memory address, which is available here, OK? So some memory address. Now what shall I? I'll just put as uh, y address, OK? Some part of the instruction will be referring to the address of the second data y. Right? So that will be there. What is the next word? 
now the processor goes through again another fetch, but now this time it is data fetch or operand fetch, right? That is the face. What is the data fetch? Similar to instruction fetch. And what is the data? So why address will be placed on the address bus? Instru earlier, PC was pointing to the instruction. So PC containers were placed on the address bus. Now the instruction points to Y address. And so now, similar to instruction fetch, it does. What it does is Y address, where is it? This particular one is available as part of instruction. So let us note it. Huh? This is available as part of instruction. And uh, since we have assumed that <coughs> IR, instruction register holds the entire instruction, some part of IR where the Y address is available. We don't know which part, okay? This in fact is available as part of IR, okay? It's not going to detail. So the, some content, some part of the contents of IR now will be routed to the address bus, right? So. It's, uh, let's see the chart. It's not shown here, okay? IR will be holding that two byte instruction. So from here, the, the path is not shown here actually, because we have not completed that. This particular thing will have to get routed to AR and it will be placed on the address bus, okay? Good. And similar to the instruction fetch, same thing will be going on. Now again, it is a question of reading, so we are just have to repeat that. Read goes to control part of the bus, and uh, in this case, there is no incrementing of PC because we are not dealing with the PC. Uh, <coughs> okay, then assuming that the data is available, then the data in what will be on data in? Da on data in you'll be having the actual contents of this Y address location, which is nothing but Y, okay? That is the data. Y is the data which we assumed is available in the memory. So memory will place that Y on data in, that is data bus, and that will have to be routed to DR2, because we have assumed DR1 holds the other data. So this will have to be routed to DR2. Let's look at the chart again, okay? So the Y data, the second data Y is coming over data, data in, and through this multiplexer, it will get routed to DR2. So now, at the end of this, DR2 holds Y, and DR1 holds X. That's what we have assumed earlier. Now, the CPU has the full instruction, the CPU has both the data X and Y, okay? So next is the execute phase. The execute phase, essentially, the DR1 contents must be added with DR2 contents, and the result Okay, we'll assume it goes to DR1. That's what must take place. Agreed? Now, what exact, this is the actual operation. This operation has been indicated where? As part of the instruction. This instruction is available in CPU, you know? So during uh, the decode or interpretation, the CPU knows that addition must be performed, <coughs> right? So that's what it is. Which means, uh, let's go to the chart and see again. DR1 holds X and DR2 holds Y, right? And ALU must get an appropriate signal so that the contents of DR1 and the DR2 which is reaching through the multiplexer, they must be added and the output, which is the sum, through the multiplexer, 
we are assuming it's passed on to dr1 so that is the data path for that agreed so just in one go it will be right it will be done finish at this point the instruction has been completely executed right then normally there is another phase which we have not discussed known as service phase will start that is you have a instruction fetch phase in general fetch phase one part will be instruction fetch another is data fetch and then execute and then service because we have not yet discussed this in detail okay something will be done after this okay something further must be done during this phase after this it will again go and fetch the next instruction and go through the same thing again follow so a simple <coughs> add instruction as you can see kinds of 1 2 3 4 5 6 oh 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 steps so 10 states okay 10 states are needed for executing this instruction uh, that means in the case of a micro programmed implementation 10 micro steps or 10 micro words will be there of course hardware logic is a different story get it fine <coughs> 